When we are suppressing those emotions, we are then looking for firefighters or um, other mechanisms to try and help us to cope with what we are ignoring. And quite often those things are things that stimulate dopamine release in our brain, which makes us feel good. And quite often those things are addictive. So they can be things like sugar, alcohol, drugs, shopping, pornography, anything that kind of distracts us from what we're feeling inside. But done over enough time, like eating enough donuts to suppress your emotions becomes diabetes, right? Eating enough um, and drinking enough alcohol to suppress your, 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 your sadness becomes hepatocellular carcinoma or an increased risk of it, right? Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. And today we have Rosemary Nebatsa. I hope I pronounced her name right. After growing up in Zimbabwe and obtaining her degree in Western medicine at the University of Oxford, Rosemary continued her education by acquiring a master's in public health at the University of Manchester. Parallel to her conventional medical path, her personal journey and its impact on her health opened up the doors to her spiritual awakening and the realization that the wisdom and guidance of practitioners from ancient and embodied traditions have indisputable value. As a result of this insight, she has spent years immersed in self-study and deep exploration of various practices. Rosemary has trained in functional medicine through the Institute of Functional Medicine and is currently undertaking a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapy. Now, there is so much more to this wonderful lady. Let's bring her on. Hi, Rosemary. How are you doing? Hey, Madiha. I'm great. Thank you. How are you? Oh, amazing. Amazing. I'm doing really well. <laughs> really, really well. Chilling in my... Uh, my flat and uh, interviewing you um so i was thinking when did we meet when did we meet we met at the space holding course right we actually met before that really uh, yeah we met at a fire ceremony for solstice yes yes yeah our friend natasha holds a fire ceremonies in it yeah i remember now and you were there and at that point i didn't really i don't think i knew you were a doctor before i think i only found out after but yeah, we'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get into that. Um, so obviously, I know who you are. Our listeners don't know who you are. Can you um, tell us about yourself, a brief overview of who you are? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I'm a GP uh, practicing in Manchester. I work at uh, the walk-in centre in the hospital, which is part of A&E. Um, so that is my traditional Western medicine pr medical practice. Um, and I'm also creating an online women's health education platform. Um, and that really incorporates much more of the holistic, spiritual um, and emotional aspects of medicine that I don't get to practice so much in my day to day job. Uh, I'm a mother. <laughs> I am a dreamer <laughs> and I'm a, um, I'd call myself an inner child advocate and um, a, a decolonizer uh, as well. So Amazing. all of those things. Yeah. Amazing, beautiful. Oh, and a dancer. And, and a, a dancer. Oh, wow. Great. What sort of dance I mean, do you do? Uh, ecstatic dance, but oh, I yeah. take it very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I love aesthetic dances it just brings everything out of you it's like you know you can go for hours and hours and hours um, yeah. so let's talk about your childhood what was your childhood like how was your upbringing bringing um, yeah tell us about that so uh, I grew up in Zimbabwe I was born in 1985 and Zimbabwean independence 
was in 1980. So I am of the generation that's termed born free. Um, so we were the post-colonial generation. And although there was independence, and there still is, and Zimbabwe is run by African people, but there is still so much um, hangover from colonial times that is present now and was even more present at the time that I was born. So I went to a lot of, I had the privilege, great privilege of going to um, excellent schools that were based on the British um, system. And so I had a very, really good standard of education, uh, which led me to Oxford University where I practiced, uh, where I studied medicine. And I was a Rhodes Scholar there, um, so I received a scholarship called the Rhodes Scholarship, which um, people like Bill Clinton um, have also had that scholarship. Um, several Australian presidents or prime ministers have as well. So it was really prestigious. Um, so I think I'm bringing the reason I'm bringing up my um, educational background more than anything else is because at the time and even now it's seen as a privilege in that um, I was able to attain um, success in the way that traditional Western standards of success are measured. But at the time, nobody recognized and neither did I recognize that it meant that I had to leave certain parts of myself behind in order to uh, assimilate all of this um, Western knowledge, like, you know, how to use different pieces of cutlery and how to speak with a certain accent, you know. Now I listen to people who have like a strong ac African accent, which is not my accent anymore. And I feel really jealous. Um, and when I feel more deeply into that jealousy, I realize that uh, I'm mourning, I'm grieving um, the fact that I had to whitewash my accent over the, the course of my life. Um, and now, you know, that warmth and that depth that people have when they speak, um, I'm just like, wow, I wish I could speak like that. And it's not mine anymore. So that is one thing that's not mine. And there were several other things that I had to leave behind that some of them that I can no longer retrieve, like my accent, um, and some of them that I have chosen to retrieve. Um, and so as much as that was privilege, uh, it was also trauma at the same time. And so I, yeah, so that's what my childhood was from an educational point of view. Um, from a family point of view, I had a very loving, supportive family who also had a lot of emotional strife going on. <laughs> And um, so my parents were separated when I was 12 and got divorced a few years after that. And um, so as much as everything looked perfect on the outside, um, definitely on the inside, and although they didn't show us anything, you know, face to face, like in, in, the, um, in the obvious aspects, children are sensitive so we could feel the undercurrents of tension and so so that's what life was like um interspersed with a lot of nature i lived on a farm a lot of music um a lot of religion which was also uh part of my spiritual awakening but also part of my uh, spiritual oppression as well mm -hmm. so it's it's just it was duality uh, as everything is you know there was i've now, with the benefit of um, retrospect, I can see the good and the bad in everything and how that has all come together to to give birth to this present moment where we find ourselves now. That's that's amazing because, you know, oftentimes I hear people, you know, like education in that part of the world, even in Asia, is for women, it's not kind of recognized like it's it's women have to kind of stay home you know kind of mentality um it's really great to hear that you come from a background where you were excelling and basically it's, it's, it's just generational isn't it it's like our ancestors wouldn't, wouldn't couldn't do it we do it <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah and and that's why i recognize it as a great privilege and it almost feels like i remember being young maybe 15 or 16 and 
someone saying to me, the job of the current generation is to do better than the previous generation. And what they meant was in a material sense that every generation, a family should be, or an ancestral line should be improving on itself materially. And I had a lot of material privilege and educational privilege. Um, and I was like, you know, how much more can a, a family or an ancestral line accumulate? Do we really need for the next generation to be more wealthy or more um, educationally privileged than the next, than the last? What is the job of this generation, my generation? And I realized that it was to be happier and it was to be more whole. Um, and so from that time, I realized that my job was to try and find what that was so that I could pass that on to my, my children um, so that they didn't grow up with the same tension and undercurrents that, they, that I grew up with and that that would be the greatest gift that I could give to the next generation um, and the generations going forward. Um, so it, it's almost as if you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants that our ancestors have had to do this work to get us to this point in time where we are comfortable enough um, to be able to start looking at the other aspects of being alive, because we're not just in survival mode anymore, um, and to enrich ourselves and the world through that. So, mm, Yeah, I think it's really, really beautiful because what I say, always say is in order for our next generation of kids to learn and be okay, openness to growth is that we have to experience that ourselves. We have to be that positive role model to teach the kids. Um, if, if we're not that, they're going to be, they're going to struggle. I just wanted to know, like you, like you mentioned already, like you were in Zimbabwe and you're st the environment is completely different to the UK. So what was the difference between studying there and here? Hmm. Um, I think, well, there, there are more black people, which hmm. was, you know, uh, really great in that, you know, you've, you've felt normal there, you know, like you didn't stand out, you didn't have to explain a lot of stuff about where you were from, there's a collective understanding, even amongst the white people there, uh, because they grew up there, they knew that, you know, black people might live in town, but we have a village, um, they understood the languages that we speak. Here, there's a lot of, it feels like explaining to do sometimes, um, which can get tiresome. Um, but what doesn't exist here, uh, which existed there, were these uh, colonial um, leftovers, you know. So in Zimbabwe, because white people had been in rulership for so long, um, it's almost like in the fabric or in the blood of the country that, you know, if a, if a white person walked into the room, then everybody kind of stands up straighter, um, changes their accent, things like that, which happens here. I mean, we there's now more vocabulary vocabulary for it. You know, talking about things like code switching, um, to, talking about things like microaggressions and uh, the things that black and brown people experience that uh, white people might be completely oblivious to. Um, not intentionally wanting to be hurtful, but not understanding the historical context which other people um, have grown up with and which inform their being. So there's less explaining to do there, but there are uh, other um, challenges in terms of the, the colonial mindsets. Um, so it's, it's different. Um, there, there's also you know, much more easy access to nature. The sun is shining, which makes a huge difference, a huge difference to, uh, I feel, to the whole energetic system in the body um, and the, the inner fire. Um, so here, you know, we have to do a lot more extra practice to, to awaken the inner fire um, and to mm -hmm. connect with it and to go to things like the fire ceremony that we went to. Whereas in Zimbabwe, it's it's there all the time, that uh, fire element. 
Wow, that's that that that's that's really amazing to hear because that's just well known there. Whereas here, it's like it's like a, an extra special thing you add on to your life, kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas you're just embodying that already uh, mm-hmm. in other parts of the world. Yeah, and I find it fascinating actually uh, how the sense of satisfaction and relaxation and smoothness that comes with being in the sun, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a stereotype possibly that, you know, African people are lazy or people that live in hot countries are lazy. And when you, when you, when it gets very hot here, you feel how much slower you move, how much more unctuous everything is. Like there's no, the the pace that we live at here does not match the heat when the heat comes. Mm. And I think it's fascinating how having this elemental nourishment from nature gives us a sense of fulfillment and peace, Mm. you know, like not needing to be in the rat race, not needing to um, acquire and consume in order to feel satisfied. It's like satisfaction is readily available from the elements from nature Mm, and so I feel like that's something that we can meditate on and tune into here and of course we don't have the sun but that doesn't mean that we can't find other ways of connecting to the fire element and to this um, nourishment internally so whether that is through um, exercise through what we eat uh, which is a more ayurvedic way of looking at life Um, And then that can help to balance the elements in our bodies and then help us to feel more greater well being and to um, and to feel more holistically uh, well and connected, uh, which then has an impact on stress, on diseases, on vitality and on longevity as well. Um, but we'll get into that later yeah that that's amazing I mean like you know I've, I've never I don't think I've come across a doctor who talks about holistic thing I was like as soon as you said oh yeah I do a list I was like what you have a doctor what <laughs> I was straight there um but yeah you know I think it's 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 incredible because we don't have from my experience you know I'm sure many people have different experiences from my experience I've I've not seen many doctors go down the route of holistic health and it's been a struggle where I've actually come from a, a family where they're very um, like uh, they, they use homeopathy so have you heard of homeopathy? yeah so they use that quite a lot and whenever we would go to the doctors like oh actually this 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 was like no that's not safe that's not safe that's no, we, there's no uh, proof uh, but we'll give you the drugs right so it's it's really refreshing to and I think that's the way forward for us like the doctors really em- embodying their holistic um, bringing it together science and spirituality holistic yeah absolutely 100 um, percent so you know and obviously we've last couple of years has been quite intense globally in terms of covid and obviously you work in the hospitals what was your experience there was a lot of pressure on the doctors and nurses what was your experience experience like Mm. interestingly so i didn't work in the hospital at the time oh actually i did but um it was very quiet in the hospital very was quiet it? in, in a and and in the walk-in center. Um, it went from, you know, us receiving 150 patients a day to maybe three or four patients coming in a day at the height of COVID. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so that we went the... down from having, you know, three or four doctors on a shift to just needing one doctor, you know, and that doctor was quite bored for for most of the time and um, because people were staying away uh, from the hospitals and from the GP surgeries as well. So interestingly, um, I was also working in a GP surgery at the time as a locum and uh, I wasn't needed because again, patients weren't coming in. That's when telephone consultations and things were starting. 
Um, and so there was, for some doctors, there was very little work. Um, so for, for GPs in particular. So it meant that along with the rest of the world, although some doctors had more work, um, particularly the ones in intensive care and respiratory doctors and things, there were other doctors who had less work and could slow down with the rest of the world. And I was one of those. So I took mm -hmm. the opportunity of that time to, yeah, to tune in and to be with my daughter. It was amazing to have three months with my five-year-old that I would never have had before. And it was very, very um, sunny at that time, the first yeah, lockdown. Uh, so we just spent so much time in the garden and walking and playing. Um, and, you know, even though there was lots of turmoil happening outside, it felt like we were in a very blessed bubble of, of peace and blessing. So. Oh, that is beautiful to to hear because you know all we hear in in the media it's uh, like the, the worst case scenario because that's that's what the mm. media is there for and it was just nice to hear like from yourself and probably some other doctors as well that it wasn't as pressured as as the as it was made out to be. Yeah. 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 Um, and I guess it's different for everybody, you know, and uh, I, I think our immediate environment is a reflection of uh, how we have arranged our internal environment. So uh, I think the whole COVID and lockdowns really brought our lives into the forefront of our, uh, to the forefront of our attention. And so if I had still been in my my marriage for example it would have been a nightmare mm, yeah. <laughs> you know i wouldn't i wouldn't have enjoyed it at all um but thankfully and with much gratitude i had come to a point where i was already trying to live more authentically which meant that you know it was just me and my daughter at home and so it, it wasn't difficult to be at home because we liked being at home you know, whereas I think people who are still on that journey, as we all are in, in many ways, of arranging the energy around us and saying, you know what, this might be something that I'm doing because I thought I was supposed to do it, but actually it doesn't resonate with me and it doesn't fulfill me and it's not good for me, even though it might look like it fits into the standards of the world from the outside. And this might need to be something that I need to let go of. Um, I think that's what COVID and the lockdowns really brought up for people was if you were tolerating something that wasn't in alignment, you were really going to feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was yeah. the breaking point. Um, mm -hmm. Like so many marriages, like so many people split up and, and mm -hmm. so many, it's like you had to sit with yourself, basically, you just had to, yes. and our world doesn't know how to deal with that. And even come in, like, you know, I used to go in doctor's surgery when, when I was in like, you know, but was spiritual and like sitting with my emotions, like doctor fix me now, <laughs> fix mm -hmm. me now. I have all these emotions and I can't deal with them. You fix me now and yeah. so that i guess the covid times brought a lot of that to it it's like no one can fix you 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 have to you have mm -hmm. it comes from within like you said yeah i was watching you, the podcast where you were interviewed Medina, <laughs> and you said you have to feel it to heal it and that that sums it all up and mm -hmm. that slowness of that time really brought feelings to the surface um, and really helped us to take the opportunity to say what is around me is um, the direct result of the decisions that I make. The decisions that I make are the result of the thoughts that I have. The thoughts that I have are the results of the emotional patterns that I have. And so like going back layers and layers, where did those emotional patterns come from? They came from my childhood. I do this because uh, it reminds me of this when my mom did this or my dad did this. 
and then you can ask yourself is this serving me still um, and then with a lot of compassion a lot of love and a lot of forgiveness then you can start to to change things and rearrange those those patterns so that what you see in the world the result of your decisions becomes a more authentic reflection of who you are um, mm -hmm. but first you have to go and feel it yeah <laughs> like you said yeah and emotions are linked to your physical body it all starts with an emotion absolutely. or trauma or anything deep right absolutely yeah yeah yeah. Um, well, talking about, you know, obviously awakenings and emotions and trauma. Um, so when did that journey start for you from yeah. just, were you, were you spiritual before or what happened? Mm. So I grew up in a very uh, Christian family um, and our church was quite high uh, Anglican, almost Catholic. So, um, I mean, we had beautiful music, um, a lot of people were very connected to God. So, um, so I grew up with that, but the other flavor of it was a lot of, uh, religious doctrine in terms of, um, stuff about, you know, guilt and sin and hell and all this like fear stuff, you know, so that was all intermeshed like this beautiful spirituality and then fear um and i remember being 12 and somebody saying oh your guardian angel is writing all the bad things that you do down and telling god and i just remember thinking and so we'd been taught this from like when i was three years old so i was like making sure my guardian angel was not seeing any of the bad stuff <laughs> yeah. i was doing and then when i was 12 i was like you know what that just doesn't sound right. Because if I was somebody's guardian angel, and obviously my guardian angel really loves me because they're my guardian angel. So if my guardian angel loves me, she would not go telling on me to God. Like, no way, no way. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. And I'm an imperfect human being. So how could a perfected angel do that? So that was the first like moment where I was like, maybe what I am being told about spirit and God isn't quite um, the full truth. And maybe there are elements of control here and things. Um, so that was like my first spark. Um, and I, I remember very deeply connecting to a light in my heart that I knew it, I knew it was there and I knew, okay, fine. I do bad things sometimes. I'm very naughty sometimes, but I knew I was a good person. Mm. I knew it. Like, even with all the rubbish, shitty stuff that I do, I knew that deep down, I was a good person. And, and I feel that that is something and that's what I often say to patients is that you, you weren't born like this, you were born perfect. Look in any baby's eyes and see see the aura that surrounds them and remember that you were born like that and so this now is a journey of remembering a journey of returning to that place um so i don't i don't feel isolated in that goodness um it's just something that i was lucky enough to connect with very deeply at, at that age um so then i worked, walked a bit further along the journey made lots of mistakes um went to India as a medical student, which was a huge part of my awakening. Um, I remember sitting on a beach one day and this Italian man who was a yoga teacher saying to me, you know, Rosemary, everything you see in the world is a projection of your mind. And it just, I, I completely understood what he was saying that, you know, like I was saying to you earlier, the situations in which we find ourselves are a result of our decisions and our decisions are a result of our thoughts and backwards and backwards so that's what he was saying but in a much more elegant way um and so i had many opportunities for awakening but it came more slowly than you know uh, than yours for example which when i listened to your story just felt like it just like descended and came in 
bam, you know. Mm. Mine was a, a much more gradual up and down story, you know, through the, the journey of life. Um, and so I was given many gentle opportunities to enter the path. And then because I wasn't listening, the universe made the, the, the lessons a little bit tougher and a little bit tougher and a little bit tougher until I was ready to say, okay, okay, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what was yeah. that point of wake up now? <laughs> what was that point? So when my daughter was born, um, and she came out, um, she, she was an emergency C-section, but she, um, I had 56 hours of labor and those 56 hours were some of the most beautiful moments that I've ever had in my life, which is what is inspiring me to do this women's health platform and education now is because there is so much, um, awakening and so much ability to connect that happens through this body um, that I didn't realize until I went through that labor and I went into a very deep warm place it felt like I was under the ocean for hours and hours and it was just waves of beauty you know and yet I had expected pain you know and uh, luckily I had done a hypnobirthing course so I'd been already suggested to that there was a different way to give birth there was a different experience available um and so even though it ended up mm. can i just uh, your uh mic is is making a lot of noise sorry guys we just had a bit of a technical difficulties but we are back now so go on rosemary (laughs) thanks madia so during this 56 hour labor um i went deep 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 within myself and um what i can the only thing that i can liken that sensation to um that i felt much later on uh was when i was having my ayahuasca journey in costa rica last year i was like this is this is the same thing this is the same uh these are the same neurotransmitters or the same chemicals that are being released by in this ayahuasca journey that I felt at that time um, when I was giving birth to my daughter. Um, And then when she was an emergency C-section, so when she came out of my, my womb, she cried and it sounded like a bell, you know, like just it was like wake up wake up wake up (laughs) that's what it felt like within me um and then I we took her back home three days later and as soon as I walked in the house I just started crying (laughs) and I said to my mom and to my ex-husband there's so much bad energy here and (laughs) and I mean there wasn't bad energy really what I was saying was this is not right. What I am going to present to this child as a normal life, what I'm going to say to this child is, uh, uh, is, is life. I'm not being wholly truthful about. Um, and, you know, now retrospectively, I mean, the relationship was okay. You know, the, 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 everything was okay but it wasn't real it wasn't complete and she and that awakening in my body um really forced me to 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 choose what is real and for six weeks you know like you were saying you had all those symptoms in your body when you had your for six weeks i was on fire Madiha, like my whole body was burning for six weeks and the midwife would come and I would say when is this going to stop is this normal is this normal and she was like yeah it's normal it's normal and what I realize now is that this was a kundalini awakening yeah I was just gonna say it like, sounds like a kundalini awakening <laughs> I had no idea I was just burning and crying 
And, you know, and sometimes I feel like, you know, what women are told is postpartum psych psychosis or postpartum depression is actually a Kundalini awakening. Or if, if we're not going to call it exactly a Kundalini awakening, it is messages from their deepest self saying what we are bringing this child into is not aligned and it's not right. And so that depression either comes from, like for me, it was fire and it was anger. And it was like, I need to get out of here, you know. Um, but because people have to suppress that fire and they're told by their doctors, oh, yeah, it's just baby blues, whatever. It's like we're all pushing each other back into situations of self-repression instead of saying, okay, so so what is it? What what are you angry about? What are you upset about? What are you feeling inside yourself is not right? And to support people to, to feel it and to understand what it is. And yes, it might mean that, you know, it's great change happens in their life. Great change happened in my life. And a lot of it was not comfortable at the time. But wow, I'm so grateful for what has come after that. And if I had just suppressed it and been like, this is baby blues, you know, there's something wrong with me. Um, I'm just going to, you know, take some tablets to, to make it all go away. Then I don't know where I would be right now, you know. It's quite interesting um, because you, uh, I have heard when when people have kids, uh, women have kids, they 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 have they go through their spiritual awakening, but mm -hmm. they go through the like you said they go through the system where everything's numbed out. Oh, it's just you know it's just blues. Oh, it's uh, it's it's depression. Uh, but that's actually your dark night of the soul. It's because something's trying to die off. Exactly. And I, I really felt like if I had two choices, get mad or get sad. Mm. And I chose to be mad. <laughs> and it was the first time in my life that I had chosen to be mad because anger, you know, is not acceptable as an emotion for an African child quite often, you know. Mm. Um, and I didn't know what I was angry at, but I was freaking angry. And I was angry because... I knew that if I said to my 10 year old self, this is your life, she would have been like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> She'd be like, nah, -uh. I was supposed to have a lot more than this. <laughs> <laughs> so my 10 year old self was like, mm -mm, no way no way no you are not going to tell me that this is it forever no <laughs> um and and she didn't want me to pretend to my daughter and tell my daughter that this was it that this was it forever because that would have been the the soil or the environment for her conditioning mm. she would have just thought this is normal this mm. is life you know yeah so that that's quite an awakening and I'm glad that you've noticed that because not many like it's like even being a doctor as well you know not many I guess would, they would go down the traditional path of just the oh it's just depression depression but then you've had you've literally had that awakening that inner knowing that something something's going on and you're meant to do something else um and you you acted on it which is which is amazing incredible yeah. um yeah. I had amazing support from my mother as well who has always you know been in my camp and she would ask she'd say are you happy and I'd be like yeah and she was like oh, okay all right <laughs> <laughs> I was like no I'm not happy <laughs> yeah um yeah so so you've so if you've had that awakening, how does holistic medicine support awakening? Mm -hmm. um, so holistic medicine brings it all together. So there's still the Western side. I respect Western medicine. I'm a Western medical doctor. Um, I My baby was born via C-section. And yet I also had the blessed opportunity to feel um, 
into the more primal aspect of myself. And I think um, with the way Western medicine and the history of medicine, we need to look at the history of medicine, really. You want a long story, Medea? <laughs> So when we look at um, when Western medicine started, right, um, and the big gains that Western medicine made, which were mainly to do with public health. So when um, John Snow discovered that cholera was transmitted by bacteria in water, um, at that time, the uh, expected lifespan of a person in England was about 33 years, you know, and then that increased because of things like public health. And so you can imagine that science and medicine seemed very much like God in terms of making people's lives longer and better. Um, but at that time, medicine was mainly practiced by herbalists, by women, by people who were in connection with the land in connection with nature, <clears throat> in connection with the moon. Um, and so science came at the time that medicine was being practiced by these people. And also religion became much more stringent in stamping out the feminine, um, Christian religion and, and Roman Catholicism in, uh, specifically. So it's the time that the witch trials happened. So these three things converged to um, push our where we sought help, where we sought medical help, out of the hands of wise women, which is what which means, and into the hands of Western science, which was great from a public health point of view, but not necessarily from an individual health point of view. Um, and so with time, that was in the 1500s, and now we are, you know, over 500 years on from that. Culture has generationally become more steered and geared towards male masculine technical kind of medicine and but the female um natural medicine is the embodied medicine so now medicine is practiced up here uh, and is you know it's practiced in laboratories and is you know we're given tablets and there's you know numbers on them um, and we are not using the other side, which is the feminine side of being in our bodies, asking ourselves our questions, even asking our ailments. You know, if you have a fibroid, if you have um, a, a breast cancer or whatever it is, asking it, who are you? Where are you from? Like, how, how did you arise within me? And to have that intimate relationship with our bodies, actually, I mean, I'm saying when the conditions arise, but actually long before, because like you say, you know, when you were sitting in your room asking yourself, how, 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 how am I feeling today? What am I feeling today? Those things actually in my mind and in the minds of um, several kinds of holistic medicine, including Ayurveda, is um, the precursors to ailments. So if you are then holding an emotion so strongly that you are not acknowledging, not finding out from it where it's come from, how you can help it, then it becomes more, it accumulates more and more and more in the body. You might feel it as muscular pain, you might feel it um, as some other kinds of contractions in the body. And sometimes it can even end up being uh, something more, more solid and real and you know manifested physically within the body uh, and how that happens and now i'm going off on a tangent but let's go <laughs> and how that happens is you know when we are suppressing those emotions we are then looking for firefighters or um, other mechanisms to try and help us to cope with what we are ignoring and quite often those things are things that stimulate dopamine release in our brain, which makes us feel good. And quite often those things are addictive. So they can be things like sugar, alcohol, drugs, shopping, pornography, anything that kind of distracts us from what we're feeling inside. But done over enough time, like eating 
enough donuts to suppress your emotions becomes diabetes, right? Eating enough um, and drinking enough alcohol to suppress your 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 sadness becomes hepatocellular carcinoma or an increased risk of it right mm. so these things have been written in ancient medicine in ayurveda in chinese medicine for eons um and only now are we beginning to understand what they meant by this that things emotions accumulate over time until they become a disease and so I've just described the mechanism of that. Yeah. Um, so where did we start? Well, <laughs> well, the the supporting holistic medicine support in uh, awakening. Oh, soul. yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so this has all been written, you know, by ancient practices that have known. And it's almost like we're so slow in Western medicine, only when it is written in a journal and has mm. been proven by five different labs all over the world, does it become real? People have been practicing this for 2,000 years mm. somewhere else and getting very good results. So why, why do we have to wait for the mechanisms of Western medicine or Western science to catch up in their ability to measure and to catch up in their ability to understand? You know, um, For example, I'm, I'm doing a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapy at the moment. And, you know, psychedelics are medicines that have been used by ancient cultures over thousands of years in the Amazon, in Mexico. And so I think it's really funny that we're calling it a psychedelic renaissance now, when it's been going on, you know, by these gatekeepers and these guardians of these medicines for such a long time. It's only a renaissance to Western medicine and Western medicine is now trying to package it in ways that it understands, right? So, you know, you're in a room with eye shades and, and headphones and, you know, it's clinical. These people practice the um, sharing of this medicine in sacred circles and in ceremonies, and they call in the directions and they call on the support of beings that are not visible to the naked eye. Um, and Western medicine does not know how to measure this, and so it cannot acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. But I bet you in a hundred years' time or before, someone is going to write in a journal, the British Medical Journal. So it turns out that calling in the directions and calling on support of otherworldly beings um, <laughs> who can come and help in the healing increases the efficacy of psychedelic therapy by however many percent and now we have found a way of measuring it uh we should do it and it's like ah yeah okay no shit Sherlock you know <laughs> but the thing is right like just how we went through the pandemic side of things a lot of people going through their awakenings during pandemic right so it's yeah. like it's I was saying to somebody the other day like thousands of years ago we had all these ascended masters like jesus and buddha and all of these masters were probably the only it was very rare awakening now it's like rapid pace mm -hmm. i wouldn't be surprised if more doctors like you awaken i wouldn't be surprised if people who are not generally known as spiritual awaken mm -hmm. in this day mm -hmm. and age yeah. because it's happening Absolutely. so fast Mm, absolutely yeah. um and i and i think the beautiful thing that comes with awakening is trust trust in your voice trust in the need for authenticity and for cultural humility you know that's really the one of the biggest things that has benefited my medical practice you know so as i said i i'm not anti-western medicine i love western medicine i practice it daily you know um but I've got so much more respect and space in my mind and in my system for what other people do. I'm very interested um, and very humble when I come to learn from people who practice in different ways. I'm not coming from the point of view of uh, superiority of Western medicine. I'm coming to with curiosity about how other things are done and why they work. 
Um, and I think that that is really where holistic medicine is, is going to thrive, is um, Western medicine is amazing from a public health point of view. Amazing. If your arm has fallen off in a car accident, you want to go to the hospital, you know. Mm-hmm. But for these more emotional kind of pain that accumulate over time to create what we call lifestyle disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, you know, things that happen over the course of, of somebody's life, that's when we need holistic medicine that listens to how other people who have had more embodied research, um, what they know. Oh, that's, yeah. that's where Western medicine needs to go. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I so, uh, Someone came to my mind, Gabor Mate, you probably know, mm-hmm. know him, yeah. like he's a uh, he talks quite a lot about the emotions and connection linked to the body. And, you know, he talks about autoimmune conditions in particular. Yeah. yeah and the yeah. self-hatred, it's like your nervous system, your immune system is attacking itself physically. Right. So yeah. what is your self-talk? What what has been your trauma? If it's like I'm not good enough, uh, you you are oh, you're an idiot. You're this. You're that. Right. You're attacking yourself. Yeah. Right. And yeah. people pleasing, not setting boundaries. And that's what he was talking about, mm-hmm. and which yeah. which yeah. is and then it manifests into a physical um, illness, which is uh, autoimmune condition. Absolutely. And it all causes inflammation, you know. Yeah. So it's I mean, our bodies are amazing. Medina. It's the, just the whole system is incredible. And I think what we need to remember is that our bodies are ancient. This is ancient technology, you know, has evolved over thousands of years, you know, from when we were running away from lions and now we're sitting in front of a computer, right? So the lion is no longer chasing you in the savanna and there's two options then you climb up a tree and you survive or it eats you and you're dead, right? Um, But now the lion is like, the emails and the bills and uh, your shitty partner and blah, 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 right? And so, but it's still activating the same neurological system that we had 20,000 years ago. Um, And so, but now this stress is constant because there's no, you can't run up a tree and run away from these things. um, And, you know, they're not gonna kill you. So, so that constant stress then activates downstream processes. So like having all of that adrenaline and all the cortisol that's released as a, as a consequence, of, consequence of stress then changes the whole internal biochemistry of how your body operates. And so you are constantly in survival mode. Your body never feels safe. Um, and so, and only in safety can your body feel, only in safety does your metabolism reach a nice harmonious balance, you know? And when you're not, you know, then your body is like, okay, we're not safe. So we need to, like every donut that we eat, we have to keep all the sugar and all the fat because we don't know if we're going to be able to, to find more sugar and fat the next day because this ancient biology is thinking, you know, we're in the savanna. We don't know if we're going to have food next week. Mm-hmm. Um, so then that means that, but the donuts are always available here. So it's like this ancient, <laughs> this ancient need to, to retain and survive, but actually we are in the time of greatest abundance mm-hmm. ever, you mm-hmm. know, um, it's, but we don't feel like it. So we need to help ourselves to create that switch in our minds and then let that filter down into our body, through our nervous system, through our vagus nerve, and to actually learn how to manage which neurotransmitters are predominant in our body. So, I mean, I can even feel as I'm talking right now, like when I'm talking about adrenaline, I'm like, and then when I'm like, and then I can even feel that like the uh, oxytocin, the acetylcholine, all the delicious ones, Mm -hmm. you know, the ones that, you know, you would have sitting under that tree behind you, um eating a mango watching the waves hearing the waves like we can have that internal environment even when we're doing our emails 
but what we need to do is to have the resources and the tools to learn how to to be so intimate with our own internal processes that we can encourage ourselves to be in certain states of um of internal harmony mm, beautifully and beautifully said yeah oh my god this is this is amazing um you know as people awaken to their true self where do you think the future of health is going to be Mm, uh, I think that it's this thing that we've been talking about that the ancient is going to become the futuristic like we will wake up and see that oh we knew it all already we had it all already you know um what what they say in Chinese medicine in you know with doing Tai Chi for example this is energy work you know, this is rebalancing not just the physical body, but the whole multidimensional body. Um, eating according to the seasons and according to the the elements and what you need. Um, this is all written, has been written and observed by people who were had space. They did not have iPhones, so they were pretty bored. They had nothing else to do but to fully observe themselves and and we can be so grateful that they documented this stuff of how the body works and what makes the body more alive um and and i think with time we will start to be more interested in what it feels like to be more alive and we will go on these journeys of curiosity within ourselves to experience it you know because right now it just feels like you go to someone else and they tell you about your body and then you do what they they say um, instead of really being like, wow, how am I doing this? Like, that is crazy. Like for me, that's, that's mental, you know? Um, and so to have this like true aliveness within ourselves and to search um, and to create more is going to be where uh, awakening beings want to go because the body is a technology, right? So this is a good place to start. You know, with any problem, there's different, uh, well, not problem, with anything, there are different, um, it exists in all realms. It exists in the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual realm, and many dimensions beyond, actually. And so part of the skill of being a healer, for example, is to find the easiest key to unlock uh, whatever it is in whichever realm. So, for example, you could have diabetes and for you, the best thing to do is to meditate. So working on the spiritual realm to unlock emotions and patterns of behavior and to understand that, oh, actually, I have space to choose between an apple and a donut and that could be the key that you learn from meditation is that I am not my thoughts I can there is a space between the choice and I can choose the apple or the donut and that could be the key to your diabetes reversal uh, and for somebody else the key could be in the physical realm you know of just you know, I, I, I need to go to the gym or, you know, or on the emotional realm, go to uh, therapy and do internal family systems or something and be like, oh, actually, every time I'm triggered, I go for the, for the donut instead of the apple. So let's work on the trigger. So there's so many different realms where we can make the interventions for more vitality. Um, and I think that this is what awakening beings are going to realize is that there is so much to play within um, and that the body itself is an incredible spiritual technology that um, people have known about for thousands of years and only in thousands of years will Western science in the way that it is now, you know, that it needs to measure and to reproduce um data in order to say something is real only in a thousand years will they be able to say oh you know that dream time meditation that the aboriginal people have been doing in australia for the last ten thousand years 
that's like quantum technology and blah 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 and then we can yeah 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 and you know and it's like yeah you know people mm-hmm. have been doing this for thousands of years we just didn't because we couldn't see it and we didn't know how to uh, measure it we denied its existence mm. it's it's interesting because uh, while you were talking about this it's like you have the east and you have the west you have two halves like split and and it's like the east is like more it's two different halves it's like yin and yang. yeah like it's like the balance for absolutely. right now right absolutely yes 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 and yeah. we need both yeah and we need both and it, someone once said to me that uh it's amazing that uh western medicine looks at health from the point of view of death so you go to medical school and the first thing that you do is you put on a white coat and you sit in front of a a cadaver and you start touching it up to try and understand life I mean that's crazy in eastern medicine they have spent like I said these thousands of years you know learning like what what does this move does this movement make me feel alive more alive does this herb make me feel alive more alive Uh, what makes me so they are have literally been feeling the effects of different stimuli that they give to themselves on their bodies and seeing what the result is instead of looking at the end result of disease and death and trying to work backwards from there it's a totally different way of thinking and both of them are valuable but unfortunately until recently one of them which feels like western medicine has uh, purported itself to be the only one yeah it's like the 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 power is on this side at the moment but it's like this slowly on this side people are waking up on this side and yeah. there i think exactly. they're and also in western medicine you know yeah. there is awakening you know now yeah. psychedelics are being brought in um functional medicine which uh i've studied as well is much more it's, it's holistic it is bringing together all of it so there is awakening happening on all fronts um, and it's a really exciting time to do it that. is it is I think like during last couple of years it was a complete switch from masculine to feminine energy and that yeah. will play a huge role whereas we've been Absolutely. in masculine energy for thousands of years um the way the world is built now and the switch was like I think I think it goes back to 2012 really when people thought the world's gonna end but I think it really goes back to that um and I do feel that like with this feminine energy coming in, there's a lot of truth in the recent past. Like like we've had quite a lot of truth and truth bombs here and there in, in terms of how the world works. It, it all will fit into as we like ascend into like um, 5D, you know. So it's, yeah, so it's all coming together. I think I think it will eventually will get to a point where we're both in harmony and we will create that unity but right now because we're in this such a um physical reality where it's like everything has to come up like your trauma everything has to come up as like clearing and you know understanding what the link is between mind body and soul so you are focusing on women's health education right now can you tell me a bit more about that yeah, so, um, I, I, you know, like I told that birth story of mine, um, and I know that I'm not isolated in that, um, and I am realizing that there is so much power in this female body um, that is untapped um, because we have been um, looking at it as if it is almost the same or secondary to the male body. Um, And so my uh, project right now is really an invitation for women to learn about their bodies. Um, Firstly, from the point of view of optimizing their health um, and optimizing their intimate connection with themselves in order then to harness the power of the body 
um, to create the multi-dimensional existence and reality that they they want to to live. So what I mean by that is um, particularly looking at the menstrual cycle and the different seasons um, of the menstrual menstrual cycle. So from bleeding to just after bleeding to ovulation to after ovulation and then back into the bleeding cycle. Um, and to give people an understanding of how the hormonal changes that happen within that um, have a huge impact on our energy levels, on the way we think, on the way we feel, um, as every woman knows, but actually how to now tap into this wave, you know, so that you're like, actually, now is my winter time. This is my time of bleeding but this is also my wise woman time. This is the time where if I can just slow down enough, I can start to receive all the messages that I need from the universe to inform the next 30 days, let's say, of the cycle. Um, so, so winter or bleeding is a time of deep meditation, you know? And then springtime after that, like, which is where I am right now, you have loads of, enthusiasm and energy it's like yeah let's go like it's almost like this is the baby time um when you're a child you know and everything you can do everything you feel like you you want to explore and you know just put all your energy out there and that correlates with the increase of estrogen as your new egg is being um is being got ready for ovulation um, and so this is the time to go and, you know, go out with people to date, to um, meet new people, to set up meetings at work, to put, to brainstorm, put it all on paper, to explore as much as you can. And then the next part of the season, the cycle is summer. So after ovulation, and this is the time to start looking at all those ideas, all those connections that were created by this increasing estrogen, and then to choose uh, what you want to fertilize, what those eggs, like the egg inside you, wants to fertilize. Um, and then to start to work on those projects, you still have a lot of energy, and uh, you still have a lot of confidence, and you're still out there. And then you go into autumn, where if that egg hasn't been fertilized, uh, then it uh, starts to prepare to be uh, released through the menstruation. Estrogen starts coming down, progesterone starts coming up. And that's when, you know, some women get PMS and feel a little bit like that. Ah. But actually, that's like, mm -mm, don't mess with me. Like right now, like now I'm really focused. Like now this is all I have time for. Um, and you you can clear away the things that don't need to be in your life. Um, and this is, it correlates to like maybe the older years of your life in your 40s or 50s, where you know yourself, you know, you don't need to have everything all the time. You, you know exactly what is going to be beneficial and you do not uh, feel sad or scared to ask for it. And then it takes you back uh, into winter again where you can receive and recharge and rest uh, in preparation for the next cycle so so this is um it's a beautiful technology to harness for women in terms of uh, organizing and tuning into the whole of their lives and to aligning our lives with nature and with the moon um, and to opening ourselves to receive from places that um, uh, we might not have access to if we don't give ourselves the opportunity to tune in. So, so that's one side of it is giving this uh, um, education about the magic of the menstrual cycle, both from a biological Western medical point of view we'll talk about the hormones we'll talk about the egg we'll talk about all of that but we'll also talk about the emotional and spiritual dimensions as well um, wow and then the other side of the platform is then talking more deeply about um uh 
I don't like to call them conditions or diseases, um, more like um, the information that the body is giving about imbalance, whether that is fibroids or polycystic ovaries or other um, gynecological health manifestations that women might have, um, and to help people to understand from a Western medical point of view, uh, the causes and uh, what can be done um, but also from a holistic point of view, helping people to tune into what could be the more multidimensional uh, contributors to those health manifestations, to this information that they're receiving. What is this information saying about imbalance or disharmony in their lives? Um, so it's really giving power back to people um, with regards to their health and giving them more information than they will receive um, from a standard Western doctor. Wow, that is, I've not heard of Four Seasons and like it's 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 crazy because the way you explained it is how it is. Like I was watching this video by Teal Swan. It's like women at that point where they were sort of aligned with their moon as well. Uh, like thousands of years ago so in the village all the women would have that period at the same time and they would go they would have a sacred space to sit and bleed into the earth exactly so we we discuss all of that um because there is something so sacred about uh women's blood and um the more of us that can become connected uh, intimately with it and not to see it as a taboo or something to hide um, but to really see it as our feminine power um, that is that's going to be amazing for the whole world um, so yeah, amazing that's and that just kind of ties into the uh, feminine energy that we're going into now it's like it's more than ever we need this yes right. exactly all the female exactly. like we are feminine to get enlightened <laughs> yeah and that's the inspiration for all of this you mm. Know? Mm. Um, yeah so we're we're going we're at the end of our interview I have some rapid fire questions for you what is your def definition of universe life god oneness 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 yeah what do you think happens when you die mm. oh that's a good one uh I'm still I'm still asking the question uh right now I feel that um the spirit that embodies us uh has the opportunity to choose where it goes and the more consciously one can die the easier it is to direct yourself to the realms that you want to to be in um, but if we are not if we have not done the work to be able to die consciously enough then we get um, drawn into back into karma um, in order to learn more um, so we will have another turn around the sun Oh, amazing. Uh, how do you define religion and spirituality? I find that religion is born out of spirituality, but then uh, is uh, contaminated by control. <laughs> mm. um, and spirituality is, uh, is open, is, is open to other types of spirituality because it is all spirituality so there is no otherness oh, amazing. Um, and it is yeah yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> oh amazing um what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn uh, not not everything is as it seems to the eye. <laughs> oh, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, actually. That is a really good one. Um, do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures? Uh, I believe that they have a lot of material resource, you know, so those horrible beginnings that is 
um, raw material for mm. alchemical transformation. So they've got a, they can, yeah. they've got a lot beautiful. of opportunity. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I am fully in present moment when? Fully in present moment when I am lying next to my daughter, stroking her arm, uh, oh. and I can feel my body, feel my body in, in that time. Beautiful. Do you believe that there is an end to healing? That there is a? Do you believe there is an end to healing? No. Uh, what well, depends on what the definition of healing is, because I think in my mind now, healing is growth. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't believe there's an end to growth. And if those two things mean the same thing, then I love it. The world needs more of what? Love. <laughs> yes. Bring it on. Yeah. Okay. So if there is someone who's going through adversity and is finding it difficult to go through a dark night of the soul or spiritual awakening right now, what would you say to them? Trust the process. <laughs> Hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, it is all working in your good, all of it, all of it, all the time. Hundred percent. Um, how can people contact you? Um, so they can contact me on my website, which is Mama Noir, uh, M A M A N O I R E dot org. Um, and also on Instagram, um, we are Mama Noir with dots in between. So we dot r dot mama dot noir with an e on the end. Oh, thank you, thank you so much for coming on. And thank you for having me, Madiha. It's always such a pleasure talking to you. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. It's like your your knowledge and insight is yeah. I was to be honest, I'm completely blown away. I don't, I can't even find the words <laughs> to be honest. I can't even find the words, but yeah, no, thank you. I'm sure many of our listeners will take um, a lot of wisdom away from, from you and hopefully it will help them in their journey, wherever they are, they, they are at. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about my favorite things to totally geek out um, <laughs> and not to leave anything out so thank you for that love it thank you thank you for listening to this episode i would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been you can share your thoughts on my facebook or instagram madia sosen if you would like to listen to this episode I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again, and I will see you in the next episode.